we are about to have an interactive debate um, between um, Mike, Michael um, C. Jackson and um, Michael Quinn Patton. We will have three rounds uh, where each speaker will be speaking for four minutes. The first round, Mike Jackson will start out on uh, critical systems thinking and critical systems practice, its origin, purpose, and niche, followed by Michael Quinn Patton um, setting out the aesthetic principles and systems concepts and its origins, purpose, and niche. The second round, then, uh, we will have uh, Mike Jackson uh, laying forth his critique of systems concepts and evaluation and what uh, system or critical systems practice has to offer. This will then be followed by Michael Quinn Patton's critique of critical systems practice as proposed for evaluation and what systems concepts have to offer. The third round, um, we hope that um, the two speakers can explore uh, the potential common ground and what the golden mean might be um, and where they can agree or disagree. Um, we will then have a Q&A for 20 minutes. Um, all participants will remain muted and um, we ask that you submit the questions through the chat and we'll be monitoring that. Um, we do prefer that your questions are addressing both speakers um, so that it's not just a question addressed to only one of them. And uh, we are, we will introduce the speakers. Barbara, do you wanna introduce um, Dr. Mike C. Jackson? Yes, thank you, Kirsten. So I have the pleasure to introduce to you uh, Professor Dr. Michael C. Jackson, or Mike C. Jackson. And uh, Mike is Emeritus Professor at the University of Hull and MD of Systems Research Limited. He graduated from Oxford University, gained an MA from Lancaster University and a PhD from Hull, and has worked in the civil service in academia and as a consultant. Between 1999 and 2011, Mike was Dean of Hull University Business School, leading it to Triple Crown accreditation. Mike has been president of the International Federation for Systems Research and the International Society for the System Sciences. He was co-editor-in-chief of Systems Research and Behavioral, Behavioral Science Journal for 26 years. In 2011, Mike was awarded an OBE for services to higher education and business. In 2017, he received the Beale Medal of the UK Operational Research Society for a sustained contribution over many years to the theory, practice and philosophy of operational research. In 2022, he received the Pioneer Award of the International Council on Systems Engineering for the development of the foundations of systems engineering as author, educator, and intellectual leader in systems thinking. Mike is known as a key figure in the development of critical systems thinking, a topic on which he has published 10 books and over 150 articles. His latest book, Critical Systems Thinking and the Management of Complexity, was published by Wiley in 2019. Mike is also currently teaching the second cohort of the Critical Systems Thinking and the Management of Complexity course, Critical System Thinking and Practice for Responsible Leadership in a Complex World, which has only started last week. So welcome, Mike. And over to Kirsten introducing Michael Quinn Patton, please. Yes, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Michael Quinn Patton who has more than 50 years as an independent evaluation and organizational development consultant based in Minnesota, USA. He is former president of the AEA and author of eight major evaluation books, including a fifth edition of utilization-focused evaluation and fourth edition of qualitative research and evaluation methods used in universities worldwide. He has also authored books on uh, qualitative research and evaluation methods, uh, practical evaluation, creative evaluation, and developmental evaluation. He co-authored a book on the dynamics of social innovation and transformation with two Canadians entitled Getting to Maybe, How the World has Changed. In 2018, he published books on principles-focused evaluation and facilitating evaluation principles and practice. 
In 2020, his book on evaluating global systems transformations was published entitled Blue Marble Evaluation, Premises and Principles. He has also co-edited a book entitled Thought Work, Thinking, Action, and the Fate of the World. He is recipient of the Myrtle Award for Outstanding Contributions to Useful and Practical Evaluation Practice, the Lazard Field Award for Lifelong Contributions to Evaluation Theory, and the 2017 Research on Evaluation Award, all from the AEA. Eval Youth recognized Michael Patton with the first Transformative Evaluator Award in 2020. And for the 2022 UN Food Systems Summit, he led the team that synthesized more than 1,000 independent dialogues into a theory of food systems transformation. Over to you, Barbara, to start off the debate. So we are ready for you, Mike and Michael. Uh, so we will time, mm -hmm. Kirsten and myself will time your interactions at four minutes each, and we will give you a short nod when your four minutes are up, so to keep it moving. Okay, over to you. We start with Mike. Are you going to ask me a question, Barbara? Oh, do you want me to do oh, this is uh, sorry Mike uh, this is the um no this you what you want me to introduce critical systems round. thinking and practice yes. okay yes. thank, yes. thank yeah, you exactly four and minutes thank you first, <laughs> first of all thanks to the organizers ES and the, the working group eight uh, for this privilege to be involved in this uh, in this conversation so thank you thank you for all those involved in organizing it um Critical system thinking and practice. Well, the one thing that systems thinking can't do or can't claim to do these days in a, a VUCA world of organized complexity is to understand the whole system, to give you an accurate representation or model uh, of, of the whole system. That's simply impossible. So uh, the enterprise of critical system thinking and practice is, is to work with, um, with, with partial truths. And these don't try to uh, represent reality. Uh, they're partial truths which are useful uh, to the human species in, in making their way uh, in the world, in, in the environment and in, and in our cultural world. So critical systems thinking and practice is very much a sort of pragmatist uh, endeavor. Uh, how can we find partial truths which are useful to us in, in our practice? And I went through the sort of uh, literature uh, of um, philosophy and social theory and identified a number of partial truths which I thought particularly uh, relevant that demonstrated themselves as useful to the human species. Uh, and lo and behold, there are uh, systems methodologies which are, uh, can, be, can be identified as being relevant to each of those partial truths. So critical systems thinking and practice doesn't try to give you a whole picture of the system. It's multi-perspectival, working with a variety of partial truths, a multi-methodological, uh, working with different methodologies, uh, which uh, seek to put those partial truths into some kind of action. Now, obviously, when you're engaged in this kind of enterprise, uh, you want to evaluate uh, what it is that you've uh, done, uh, what it is that you've achieved in an intervention. And so in completing a series of papers on critical systems practice, uh, I went into the literature on systems thinking and evaluation uh, to try and get some handle on how best to evaluate a multi-dimensional intervention using critical systems thinking and critical systems practice. And I found three types of literature uh, in the field. Uh, one was a single systems methodology approach whereby a single approach to system dynamics uh, or critical systems heuristics was used uh, to evaluate uh, what had happened, to contribute what was happening to what was happening. Uh, and that's great. There was some really good work there, uh, but obviously a bit narrow because each of these methodologies reflects one worldview. So if you're trying to be multidimensional, you need to bring in more than one uh, perspective, more than one methodology. It's then clear to me looking at the literature that the, the dominant trend uh, in systems, systemic evaluation, was what I call the systems concepts 
uh, approach, uh, which had been championed by a number of people, but perhaps most influentially uh, by, by Michael in, in, in his books on uh, principles based evaluation, uh, developmental evaluation, and blue marble uh, evaluation. Really interesting uh, stuff. But it was clear that you know not everything was rosy in the evaluation garden. Some people uh, wanted to be a bit more theoretical, more methodological in in systemic evaluation. And I think in uh, one of the what was a very complimentary view of one of Michael's books, uh, the the reviewer said that uh, evaluation remained a, an embattled profession, perhaps in need of a renaissance. So. I took another look at it through a critical systems practice lens and went back, uh, went back to some early work that was done at Hull, uh, particularly by Amanda Gregory, uh, and sought to develop a critical systems practice approach to uh, systemic evaluation, which I'll talk about in my next four minutes. Thank you for the keep, excellent timekeeping, Mike. <laughs> it's over to Michael now. Well, let me uh, add my thanks to the European Evaluation Society and to the Working Group on Systems, uh, to all of you participants uh, joining us, and certainly to Mike Jackson for being a part of this. To help me uh, with my timing, I'm going to, to use slides uh, to keep it uh, on going for me. So. Um, When um, in 2007, Bob Williams and Iraq and Mom published the Systems Concepts and Evaluation that included 12 different approaches of the kinds that, that Mike had been talking about, um, Bob Williams has, has said, over the systems field nearly 100 years of life, there have been many attempts to identify what all these aspects of the field have in common. In recent years, a loose consensus has formed around these components. Understanding interrelationships, acknowledging multiple perspectives, making and reflecting on boundary choices, and most importantly, integrating these three concepts to enable systemic thinking and systemic practice. Um, and in 2018, after a year's work, some 30 systems evaluators put out a publication on principles for effective use, which took the concepts and converted them to principles and added the category of dynamics. Um, uh, Mike Jackson has said that these systems concepts are theoretically inadequate and of limited use, though, as you just heard him say, they've gained considerable traction in the evaluation community. And the question is why? So I thought I would take that on here in our first segment, basically arguing that the field of evaluation is conceptually and methodologically driven. Concepts are applied and adapted to context and situation. Concepts lead to priority evaluation questions, which lead to designs, methods, and measures. So here's a whirlwind tour of influential conceptual frameworks in evaluation that are part of uh, the ways in which we would incorporate systems concepts. Evaluation itself, M&E, distinguishes monitoring conceptually from evaluation, which is morphed into MEL, monitoring evaluation and learning. Early on, Bloom's taxonomy, which uh, distinguished different ways of thinking, uh, became important as a foundation. Uh, Kirkpatrick's four levels of training results has had widespread influence. The SMART goals are five con concepts about what constitutes a good goal. Uh, Scriven's classic formative summative distinction is conceptually based. Uh, Dan Stufflebeam's early and influential SIP model looked at context, input, process, and product. The program evaluation standards are basically five concepts that tell us what constitutes a good evaluation. Uh, the most widespread uh, criteria for international development are six concepts for what should be evaluated in a program. Effectiveness, impact, relevance, coherence, sustainability, and efficiency. Utilization-focused evaluation has two uh, core concepts, primary intended users and primary intended uses which gives the principle of focusing on intended use by and with intended users in every aspect of and at every stage of an evaluation. DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, are currently getting a lot of attention conceptually. And so we have a whole series of conceptual yin-yangs in evaluation. 
accountability versus learning, independence versus interdependence, autonomy versus collaboration, generalizing versus contextualizing, objectivity versus subjectivity, attribution versus contribution, project focus versus system focus, and the most widespread concept of all, the resources, activities, outputs, outcomes, and impacts that make up the basic logic model and to which systems thinking and systems concepts are a response. And so when the interrelationships, perspectives, boundaries, and dynamics emerge uh, in the field, we knew what to do with these because we know how to take concepts and apply them in evaluation, how to make use them, how to make them useful as sensitizing concepts, as minimum specifications to apply within a foundation of contextual and situational analysis. And that's what we've done with the systems concepts. Thanks very much, Michael, for also for excellent timekeeping, four minutes. Um, and now we come to the second round in, in interactions, which is uh, there. Now we are hoping that Mike can speak a bit about the critique of systems uh, concepts in evaluation and what STCS, sorry, critical systems thinking has to offer and responded to Michael by Michael on the critique of uh, critical systems practice as opposed to evaluation, as proposed for evaluation and what systems concepts offer. So we start with um, Mike first, please. Thanks, Bob. Um, I'm, I'm concerned with um, uh, the way in which we use systems thinking uh, in uh, e evaluation. Uh, and to try and pick out some issues that I see with the systems concepts approach, which means uh, the use of interrelationships, perspectives, boundaries, and, and, and dynamics um, in, in evaluation practice. And to make the case for uh, what I think is the clearer guidance that critical systems practice can give. The um, uh, problem with the concepts is, is that they don't reflect uh, the full range of systems thinking or the full range of uh, systems uh, approaches. Uh, they're actually a relatively narrow uh, set of concepts if you look across the, the, systems, uh, the systems field. Um, if you were to take one of the best known systems thinkers, uh, Peter Checkland, uh, he comes up with the notion that the key systems concepts are uh, communication and control, cybernetic concepts, uh, an emergence and, uh, and hierarchy. Uh, Patrick Hoverstadt, who's the, the chair of um, System and Complexity and Organizations, the UK professional body for systems thinking, comes up with um, 33 systems principles uh, in his, his recent book, The Grammar uh, of Systems. Uh, and I, I think it's not doing systems thinking justice and po possibly not doing evaluation much good just to stick to uh, four concepts out of the very many that exist in systems thinking, all reflecting upon different uh, systems approaches. So that's my first point. Uh, my, my second point is that um, I feel that the, the concepts uh, can be interpreted very differently uh, by different people according to their existing uh, worldviews. And that concepts on their own, separated from uh, the worldviews or the historical, historical theoretical traditions, which make them meaningful, are actually relatively empty uh, and meaningless. Uh, and you have to see uh, concepts within a system of signs, a language game, which gives them meaning. So, for example, the concept of uh, interrelationships in system dynamics, that means causal relationships in feed forward and feedback loops. In soft systems methodology, interrelationships refers to the relationships between different stakeholders and their particular uh, and their particular worldviews. And so, totally different uh, meanings there. Uh, and I could say the same for all of the concepts. Uh, boundaries in system dynamics means all those things which you regard as endogenously influential on the system. Boundaries in critical systems heuristics means what values are in, and, and facts are included um, in, a particular, uh, in a particular decision to change something some way and which are 
uh, excluded and what impact that has upon uh, uh, has upon stakeholders. So unfortunately, I think that the concepts are pretty meaningless unless you take them back to their root metaphors or the intellectual traditions from which they emerge. Now, the danger of that for me is that the people who are using these concepts uh, are likely to interpret them uh, according to their existing worldviews. And as we know, uh, the tradition in much of evaluation and in much management theory is to go back to the mechanistic perspective. Uh, and I feel that people will have no difficulty whatsoever interpreting these concepts according to a, me a mechanistic worldview that they already have. Therefore, I argue that the clearer guidance offered by the range of systems methodologies which are incorporated uh, within critical systems practice can provide clearer, more precise guidance and is a better way of using systems approaches in evaluation. Thank you very much, Mike. Excellent. Timekeeping again. And now we turn to Michael for your response to this for the next four minutes, please. So part of what makes the systems concepts useful is that they can be understood by ordinary people without understanding the theoretical and epistemological and ontological origins of, of the different approaches. We're often in evaluation dealing with those basic kinds of, of understanding through concepts. So let me again share uh, my screen to talk about the concerns I have about critical systems practice. Uh, in uh, in the model that Mike Jackson has given us of the four stages of, of critical systems practice, based upon each of these, a full article uh, that I urge people to read in the Systems Research and Behavioral Science Journal. He puts evaluation as the fourth stage. Um, and one of the main things we've been working on for the last two decades in evaluation is moving evaluation from being thought of as a thing that comes at the end to being embedded all the way through, infusing evaluation thinking throughout a process, uh, evaluating the problem situation definition, evaluating intervention strategies, evaluating adaptability, infusing evaluative thinking throughout. And so while he's critical of the mechanistic approach, as we just heard, I think that his four stages are epitomizing mechanistic thinking. In the fifth edition of utilization-focused evaluation, we've gotten rid of steps and stages, have identified 10 principles, and infused those principles throughout evaluation as an interdependent set for all aspects of the questions that emerge. He also talks about, uh, in his summary of critical systems practice, five systemic perspectives that have demonstrated a capacity to provide significant insight into complex situations. The machine, the organism, cultural, political, societal, environmental, and interrelationships. And these are, in fact, perspectives. These are themselves conceptual distinctions. And these systemic perspectives are elaborations of the system's concept perspectives. From my point of view, they constitute a conceptual framework. Uh, including interrelationships. But I have taken exception to including the machine category in a critical systems perspective uh, or treating that as systems thinking, because I do think it legitimizes linear reductionist mechanistic thinking as a systems approach. Uh, Mike Jackson wrote in response to my video, Michael, that's me, suggested by highlighting the mechanical systems perspective, CSP is encouraging the linear logic-based model of evaluation. This, he says, is a strange point to me. I do think it important in any evaluation to give thought to whether the chosen goals are being achieved efficiently. Nothing wrong with that, surely. Well, let me tell you what's wrong with that, Mike. The machine question in your summary asks, is there an agreed goal? Are the necessary parts well organized to achieve the goal efficiently? And are the necessary components to hand and easily obtain? Those are pretty simplistic dichotomous questions. For the last six decades, since Ralph Tyler introduced goal attainment as a definition of evaluation in 1965, 
We've been deconstructing goals and making them complex and systemic. Perspectives on goals include asking whose goals, whose values expressed in goals, how are indicators picked in to respond to goals? What are the key performance indicators? Boundary questions, goals for what? Goals versus participant needs, relevant goals, right goals, meaningful goals, smart goals, conflicting goals, multiple goals, vague goals, goal for evaluation. Interrelationships include relations to strategy, mission, vision, objectives, values, context, and dynamic changing goals. So from my perspective, the simple dichotomous machine question you're asking is quite inadequate for dealing with the complexities of what we know are actually happening uh, in goal-based work and is only one small element of evaluation which ought to be infused throughout. Excellent, thank you, Michael. And now we enter the third round um, of, of debate for another four minutes each. So now we hope that um, both speakers can uh, elaborate on some potential common ground and where they agree, disagree. For, uh, so starting with Mike again, and then followed by Michael. So Mike, over to you. <clears throat> well, I wish I could go through some um, points which would, would show me agreeing with Michael about the, uh, the, lin the, the inadequacy of the linear mechanistic approach. And obviously within those perspectives, it's just one that we use sometimes uh, and the four are explicit as well in any form of evaluation which of course should take place throughout the process so i agree there the let me let me be clear that um i i've called the um, critical systems of thinking and practice an ideal type that that's ideal type in in the technical sense used by max weber the sociologist so it's a, a theoretical construct uh, which which sets out a model uh, which um, might be useful in in research uh, basically um, it's not an ideal in 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 the sense that um, it's something that you would necessarily uh, want to uh, try and bring about in practice it's something for comparing uh, practice to a theory for comparing practice uh, comparing practice to so for example in, in Weber you, he has the concept of bureaucracy of course and an ideal type of bureaucracy uh, and doesn't want to bring that about necessarily wants to uh, use it as a theoretical construct which you can compare things in the world uh, in the world too so that's the way in which I use the concept of uh, ideal type uh, and critical systems practice is, is obviously not an ideal uh, because it'd be very hard to put into practice in any real world e evaluation, as, as Michael has actually uh, pointed out. So the concept of the sort of uh, golden mean is some kind of debate between this theoretical construct uh, and what you can actually achieve in any kind of uh, practical uh, evaluation, where, of course, uh, the circumstances on the ground and the, the resources available, the money available, the competence of the people involved uh, will all be more influential in terms of what you can actually achieve. But reflecting upon the ideal type as a construct, I think, uh, can still be highly useful in guiding uh, evaluation. Uh, I came across the idea, it was brought to my attention by Peter Vadventhi from South Africa, but I think it was a Michael Scriven idea originally of, of uh, meta-evaluation, um, uh, where you evaluate evaluations in terms of um, what they do well and what they don't do well. And I thought, well, maybe uh, critical systems practice is a form of meta-evaluation. So in any particular evaluation, what happens on the ground is one thing, you do your best to achieve a an evaluation which is useful for all the stakeholders there, which is beneficial to the people involved. But you can perhaps then reflect upon how it was distorted in practice uh, using uh, critical systems thinking practice as a meta-evaluation approach. But then I thought, well, if you can do meta-evaluation, uh, then you should be able to do evaluation better. But if you know how to do meta-evaluation, you should know how to do evaluation. Uh, so why not stick it up front rather than leave it till after, after the event? And I do think that as a kind of mirror on what's actually going on in an evaluation uh, intervention, then critical systems practice can serve that role. Uh, another uh, point of similarity, Michael's got a principle of, of skin in the game. 
Um, and I like the way he, he puts that, describes that in Blue Marble Evaluation. Uh, and if you like, um, from the systems point of view, uh, if systems thinkers are going to have more impact, critical systems practice is going to have more impact upon evaluation, then it has to have a bit more skin in the game. Uh, I admit that freely. I'm not uh, an evaluation expert myself. Uh, I've just looked at the literature of systems thinking and evaluation. So perhaps the overview of systems theory and the, its attempt to get to grips with what systems thinking is about today, provided by critical system thinking and practice, together with the skin in the game that's been developed over time through Michael's experience, we can get somewhere towards a golden mean, which can benefit and see a renaissance in systemic evaluation, which is inclusive of all systems approaches as in the manifesto of working group eight, I think. Thanks so much, Mike, and for keeping to the four minutes. And thanks to the NOD for uh, TWG8 as well. Uh, so now we go over to Michael responding uh, to Mike with your four minutes. Thank you. So I appreciate the uh, opportunity to, to put our heads together around the search for a golden meme. Uh, the idea having originally come from Aristotle, where virtue falls between extremes. And I'm going to take this opportunity as an evaluator to offer um, in the, the notion of golden mean some additional feedback about the way in which I see the presentation of critical systems practice could be more useful for evaluators. Um, in the questions that are asked in the summary, and the articles and the books that Mike has done go into great depth, they're multi-method, but the summary uh, that you've created asks very simple questions. Is there an agreed goal? Um, we need to get beyond dichotomous questions. The organism question, are the subsystems functioning well? Dichotomous question. Systems inquiry would ask in what ways, to what extent, under what conditions, with what results and consequences? The cultural political question, is there agreement about what needs to be done? Uh, another dichotomous question, the societal environmental question, have the interests of all stakeholders been considered? Uh, so a part of a gold mean, I would think, is to ask more sophisticated systems-based questions. And the summary that you've done doesn't do justice to the depth and uh, complexity of the questions you actually inquire into in the work. Um, one extreme to overcome, I think, is the best practice claim. And we've gone around about this. Professor Jackson wrote in response to my, my uh, video critique, Michael, again me, objects to the hyperbolic claim that TSP is the best approach to systemic evaluation. My actual claim, he wrote, is more modest. It is that CSP represents my best attempt to draw upon what the systems tradition as a whole currently has to offer. Well, Mike Jackson was editor-in-chief of Systems Research and Behavior Science for, as I understand it, some 26 years. As you heard, he's written a large number of books. He's a connoisseur of words and grammar. So let's look at what he actually said. In the Critical Systems Practice article, he says, the aim is to set out where thinking has reached on the best way to carry out each of these stages. In the article, he says the following section seeks to refocus the thinking and evaluation community on how best to take advantage of systems thinking to improve their practice. And he says the three papers together with this one detail the four stages of the CSP and set out where my thinking has reached on the best way to carry out a multi-methodological intervention. So compare statements. In his written response, he said, my thinking on the best way, um, uh, in the original published statement, in his written response, he says, my best attempt, where there's a clear boundary and a clear ownership of perspective. So I think he has actually proposed that he thinks he has the best way in the original article. And a golden mean is for us to agree that there isn't a best way. Now, in one of the comments on my YouTube video from a colleague and a, a proponent of critical systems practice, took issue with my use of the terms dangerous and empty as discursive distortions in describing the best practice claim. Um, empty, I said, because best could not be validated. 
and dangerous because, and I stand by this, the belief in knowing what is the best and imposing that belief on others is the basis for colonialism, imperialism, conflict, polarization, intolerance, violence, and war, among other evils, even debates. So yes, I think claims that something is the best is dangerous. And so a golden mean would be to offer our best thinking insofar as we are able, but not assert that whatever conclusions emerge constitute best practices, contingency theory reigns, and I think other areas of agreement are the value of the pragmatic stance and the value of seeing men specs having a role, but against ideal types, depicting a continuum of possibilities and opportunities to engage people in complex dynamic systems thinking. Thank you very much, Michael. So now we had three rounds of um back and forth, and uh, we have come to the end of this uh, four minute, uh, three rounds of four minute each format. And thank you both very much for these concise uh, uh, propositions of what you what you were uh, proposing. Now we are coming to, we want to make uh, the use of the remaining time to give the floor also to some questions. And we feel we have collected some of your questions here on chat and it's still open to you. And um, Actually, Kirsten, would you like to kick off with the first question that we have pre-prepared because we also asked um, the members of TWG8 for uh, some questions, so we start with those. Kirsten, would you like to pop the first question, please? Yes, um, this, came, this is the question that came in um, from our uh, thematic working group, um, who we gave an opportunity to ask questions ahead of time. Um, what is the most significant hindrance to the uptake of systems thinking, uh, coupling systemic and systematic dimensions in practice amongst the wide range of professional practitioners involved with policy advice, including evaluators? How might systems thinking practice better equip non-systems thinking practitioners uh, from different professions, given the constraints identified? Um, and if we'd like for both of you to um, see if you can address this question um, as quickly as possible so we can get through as many questions as possible. Maybe if you're able to address this in one minute, that would be fantastic. Um, and uh, uh, we'll start with, uh, with Mike Jackson. Thanks, Kirsten. Um, it's interesting that I've, I've seen, uh, well, I'm working on one document with the Alliance for Health Policy and Systems Research on which addresses this issue directly. And I saw another document, um, uh, which was about, Nikki Zimmerman was one of the authors, and it, it, was, it was about the difficulty of introducing system thinking in the UK civil service. And they both come to very similar conclusions. Um, so I, I don't think we knew the answer, but I think we, we may be now getting closer to the answer. Uh, one obviously is the traditional ma mechanistic mindset against which we, uh, Michael and I are both, uh, both fighting, I think. Uh, the, the second is the, is the way that organizations are structured bureaucratically so that, uh, and in silos, which prevent um, cross-silo, cross-level thinking, um, which is difficult, therefore, to get system thinking going across an organization. Uh, but thirdly, it's system thinking itself, which has tended to be fragmented, uh, divided into different warring factions, uh, which has not helped. Uh, the discipline establish itself, transdiscipline to establish itself. Uh, and it's really the purpose of critical systems thinking, critical systems practice, uh, to have a look at the different strands of systems thinking and see what their relative strengths and weaknesses are, so that there is prospect of uh, using them in combination and, and, and revealing the pattern that I believe exists uh, in the different approaches they adopt to complexity. I would uh, add that a, a major hindrance to using systems thinking is becoming that the language of systems and complexity are becoming widespread in a very mechanistic way. They're be, they have a certain cachet now. So people are saying they're using systems approaches when they're not. Um, part of the reason for uh, the systems concepts is 
not the final word on doing system thinking, not that they stand alone, but that they are doorways into trying to actually get people who are so deeply grounded in linear mechanistic thinking to open up the possibilities of thinking otherwise. Uh, Kirsten mentioned that I was part of analyzing a thousand independent dialogues for the United Nations Food System Summit. And part of what we concluded was that all of these dialogues use the language of systems, food systems. The summit itself was all about food systems. It raised the visibility of food systems, but the actual thinking remained almost entirely linear, mechanistic, and very surface about systems. So the, the, the challenge is huge. And I think we do have to work together to both identify what system thinking is and to say when people are, are actually engaged in linear mechanistic thinking that they're calling systems um, so that we don't uh, reestablish that. And that was part of my worry about creating and including mechanistic thinking in the critical uh, systems practice piece. But we've got a lot of work to do. The extent to which this is a paradigm shift cannot be underestimated. We are taught linearly. Our culture is linear and mechanistic and reductionist. And so this is a big change. It's going to be huge. And we're going to have to all work together, as Mike said, to do it. Yeah, the, the, just to follow up on that, the UK uh, Go Science, the Government Office for Science, has published three manuals on systems thinking, uh, toolkit, journey, and uh, case studies. And as Michael says, uh, despite the nod in the direction of systems thinking, they're all based upon traditional linear policy process and uh, essentially mechanistic in orientation. Thank you very much uh, from both of you, uh, Michael and Mike. Um, let's get to the live questions. Um, Barbara, do you want to um, ask so there have been um, a few questions coming in through the chat. Um, Barbara, I don't know if you uh, if you have one in mind. Um, I think we've had about yes. four or five questions come in. We had quite a few questions, so we have to be unfortunately quite selective. So, uh, so let's maybe uh, go with this one here. Um, uh, it was asked, uh, I wonder if either or both speakers feel they could ground this discussion at the practical level and give a brief example, real or hypothetical, of an actual evaluation and un unpack a little how their different views may be reflected in the everyday realities of how we as evaluators might set about our work. Um, I'm, I'm happy to go first. The... the um... The, the, the whole tradition of critical system thinking, uh, tradition of uh, evaluation, which, which you know started strongly and then then went off, but people seemed to lose interest in it or go, went on, on to other things, uh, was always orientated around taking different perspectives uh, uh, upon a situation. Uh, we looked at the various evaluation approaches available, which were goal, that time were sort of goal-based, stakeholder-based, uh, and so on. We were always incidentally involved in in formative evaluation, which I think later came to be called developmental evaluation in Michael's work. So, uh, and, and we produced a, a manual for the evaluation of um, a Council for Voluntary Service in the UK. This was funded by a grant from the Levy Levium Trust. Uh, and it, and as, that, as that work particularly involved, evolved, uh, what it seemed to me sensible to do is in, in any context, uh, using a broad, rounded, systemic perspective, using these partial perspectives, uh, was to judge whether any organisation was uh, achieving whatever goals were set out uh, by itself, checking whether, in fact, uh, it what it was doing, what the intervention was doing, was making the organisation more adaptive and resilient, checking there was greater mutual understanding among the stakeholders involved about what they were seeking to achieve, checking that um, the disadvantaged had a say and that their position was being improved by what was being achieved and checking that a large number of factors had been taken uh, into account. Now, these are different perspectives. In a sense, they can be contradictory perspectives. I quite like that uh, idea that they contradict themselves and that, that aids your thinking and it's a balancing act in all cases uh, when you're doing that. And we have systems methodologies that can lead the evaluations in all those different, from all those different perspectives. And that's what I do uh, in a real world evaluation. 
on the uh, the link that you posted to my YouTube channel, I have a a theory of transformation video based on the Food Systems Summit uh, and agriculture work that would go into depth about how we approach this that systemically. But let me quickly just summarize the comparison. In traditional linear uh, evaluation of agriculture, you look at inputs and outputs, and the main uh, outcome being measured is yield, whether yield of the crop is increased. If you bring a systems perspective to that, you ask not only about the efficiency question of inputs and outputs, but what is the food systems uh, system? Uh, you look at gender relationships, you look at land ownership, you look at, at the power dynamics, you look at the larger economic system within which it takes place, and you do full cost accounting, not just whether yield is increased, but what are the effects on environment? What are the effects on human health? So if you evaluate industrial agriculture simply by an input-output yield measure, you get one kind of result. If you look at industrial agriculture in terms of its effects on the socioeconomic system, which critical systems brings, the, looking at the, the cultural, the power dynamics, you get a very different understanding of what the, that system is, looks like and what its effects are on the environment and on society. Uh, it's another point of agreement that there'd never be a critical systems practice evaluation without considering things such as sustainability and equity. Yep. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I'm afraid that the clock is ticking very quickly um, and um, we are getting to close to the end of the hour. Um, Therefore, I would like to take the liberty to pose um, a closing question um, that was pre-curated, um, and that goes as follows. Um, you are each prominent figures in your respective fields. What does this debate and your exchanges today say about the state of the relationship between the systems and evaluation fields? Um, and uh, Mike Jackson, would you like to go first? <laughs> um, well, it's underdeveloped, un unfortunately. And um, I I've seen, I think we've seen some of that today. I, I don't have sufficient understanding of the evaluation field, I freely admit. Uh, and I, I think I do know a fair bit about the, the, uh, the systems field. But what, what you can... Uh, what you can say clearly is that both are going down the same uh, if, if traditional linear mechanistic reductionist evaluation uh, is not uh, of use in the VUCA world of dynamic complexity, then we have to look at uh, new ways forward. And that seems to be recognised in both the evaluation community, at least those evaluators who are engaging with systems thinking. And it's certainly recognised within uh, the systems community uh, which uh, looks to um, other forms of evaluation. I like those to be quite well structured in terms of these perspectives and methodologies reflecting those perspectives, which have proven useful to us, uh, because I think you evaluate on what's proven useful. Um, pragmatic approach. So uh, I can only think that um, uh, benefit will come from a, a closer evaluation, a closer relationship between evaluation and, the, and the, the systems community, perhaps a broader conception of systems thinking in the evaluation community and the more inclusive uh, approach to what it has to offer. And from the systems community, go back to the point of uh, skin in the game, actually you can't, systems, you can't sit back and just make pronouncements. It has to get involved in these things and show its worth. Um, I would very much uh, add that we are in a, a period of, of global crisis, what's being called the poly crisis, uh, the climate change, the pandemic, increased inequality, misinformation, uh, economic turbulence, refugees, and that going forward, uh, our world has to move in, in the context of the climate emergency and these poly crisis away from just looking at projects and programs. The evaluation grew up in the project. It has a project mentality, and that project mentality is a linear reductionist project mentality with logic models and smart goals. But in the future, the future of humanity around sustainability and equity is going to depend on systems change. 
And that means that the unit of analysis for evaluation has to move from projects and programs to systems, uh, understanding systems, changing systems, indeed transforming systems. And so evaluators are gonna to have to get up to speed and learn to think systemically and be able to engage with system thinkers like Mike Jackson to help us look at how systems are evaluated, how systems are transformed uh, and move beyond the limitations of project and program thinking to both think in systems, evaluating systems, both through skin in the game and soul in the game, because we care about these things that we are using our best thinking to help transform systems to be more sustainable and equitable. About that, we very much agree. And that I think is the essence of the golden mean. Thank you so much, Mike and Michael, for these excellent um, yeah, responses to this closing question, which brings us indeed near, near the closure of this. Uh, unfortunately, it's already up. It's been fascinating. And uh, we want to thank you both uh, very much again for coming here to have this fascinating and insightful debate uh, with each other, uh, building on your your publications on these uh, issues over the while. It's been fascinating to actually uh, listen to you both discussing this face to face. And we very much uh, uh, want to thank you for your contributions, your openness, your insightfulness and provocations as well. And uh, and it, we see here in the chat um, as well, there has been a suggestion for a rematch down the road. And uh, <laughs> well, we hope that this will be only the first round of many more to come and further exchanges on the uh, uh, various evaluation and systems thinking and practice communities and indeed to come much closer together. And it's actually been very, um, very, yeah, in, uh, fascinating to see that actually you have much more agreements with each other than perhaps came across in the various publications and you found a number of common ground areas of common ground and indeed maybe the search, the mean search for the golden means has come a little step closer and uh, it's probably important to stay in conversation together and um, yeah we want to thank you very much and also for thanking the EES uh, to sponsor this event and um, and we'd like to, yeah, we will, in the TWG8 and TES, we are very much determined on working on exactly those issues. That's why we set ourselves up uh, to actually bring these uh, concepts closer to, together to each other and into evaluation practice. Uh, so we will plan to have some further uh, events in the uh, remainder of the year. And uh, I'll be just starting. So we are really delighted that this was such an uh, inspiring kickoff with uh, both of your contributions and without further ado we want then to well ask you to watch the space and join us if you want if you if you feel able to or interested and uh, see you down the road and then we want to give the uh, last word to may to close this event yes um very quickly uh, with one minute to go uh es has been enormously privileged to host this debate and we would very much like to encourage both uh, Mike and Michael to continue this debate and to extend it outwards. It's clear that we need to have a new paradigm of thinking and that this is an educational endeavor to shift the linear thinking and to introduce a new way of thinking that is systems based rather than the traditional, as Mike, Michael says, the traditional projects based and for that I think we need more debate and we need to enable people to start thinking themselves out of their own boxes and that would suggest that we widen this forum to include those policy makers, those commissioners of evaluation, wider groups and I would hope that we can work with you Mike and Michael to have an extended debate as part of our program of events as an EES leading up to, and I can announce to all of you now, our 2024 conference, which will take place between the 23rd and the 27th of September 2024 in Rimini, Italy. And we'll look forward to our debates in advance of that on this topic, as well as hopefully having a large focus on systems approaches in the 2024 conference. Thank you again 
and we've been delighted to have Mike and Michael here today.